Good day, everyone. Welcome to Christ Commission Fellowship in San Francisco. My name is Patrick Concepcion, and on behalf of the church, I would like to say that we are glad that you can join us today online. We hope and pray that this worship service will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Before we get started, just like when we were meeting physically in church, we would start by greeting one another by shaking hands. This morning, I would like you all to greet one another online as we worship. Click that chat button below and encourage someone today. While you're doing that, allow me to remind you that if you have any questions or need more information about TCF San Francisco, we invite you to connect with us through the different online platforms on the screen, and we would be happy to assist you in any way possible. Whether it be a question about our different ministries, prior request, or any kind of need, we would like to hear from you. This morning, our senior pastor, Pastor Peter Tan Chi, will be closing our series on the book of Psalms. Today, he will be talking about being fearless. And as we continue on this prolonged season of sickness, worry and fear, where do we find strength to keep going? Let's listen to the message so we can know how to move from being fearful to fearless. But before the message, let us all join our voices together and sing our praises to the Lord. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I Crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though trouble lingers still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always.
Good morning, CCF. Welcome again to another day of worship. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and let's all sing about that. This Jesus that carried our shame, this Jesus who rose from the grave, same Jesus we worship today, we worship today. Still on the moon, sing Jesus is making us new, is making us new. Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we have an amazing privilege again of worshiping together. The topic is found in Psalm chapter 27. How do we deal with fear? From fearfulness to fearless. But before we begin, I'd like us to hear a testimony from one of our members, his Dr. Nakpil, the head of the Critical Care Division of the Lung Center. Let us hear his story. As a lung specialist and head of the Critical Care Division of Lung Center, I was already monitoring the progression of this unusual pneumonia that was causing lung failure and death even before the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic and called the disease COVID-19. 
When the first cases finally appeared in our country, I gathered my family at the dinner table one night and warned them of the oncoming crisis. I saw the statistics. The death rate was highest among those 60 and above and those with other health concerns. At 63, with a history of a mild stroke and heart disease, I knew that if I were to get infected, my chances of surviving was pretty much zero. I wanted to prepare my family without unduly scaring them. I could feel the emotion and see the tension on their faces as they questioned the wisdom and need to expose myself to such a risk. I explained to them that this was the ministry I had chosen to serve the Lord with. How could I shrink away from my duties and responsibilities? But foremost in my mind was, what excuse could I give my Lord? I also discussed with them plans for isolation and which room would be best suited for me to avoid contaminating my family. As head of the critical care units, I would definitely be taking care of the most severe cases. Events progressed rapidly. The Department of Health declared Lung Center as a referral center for the most severe cases of COVID-19. On March 12, our first two critically ill patients arrived. On that same day, my voluntary self-imposed quarantine started. Four days later, I came down with fever and severe body ache. On March 20, eight days after being exposed, I drove myself alone to the hospital to be admitted, not wanting to expose anyone to my illness. As I walked to the car, I saw my family waving goodbye from the stairs, and I vaguely remember thinking this might be the last time I would see them. The problem with being a doctor is that you know what's happening to your body as each new symptom appears, and you can anticipate the complications as each treatment is prescribed. So when my oxygen level started dropping and I began feeling short of breath, I had to decide on whether I would allow my colleagues to pass a tube down my throat and connect me to a ventilator, which is a machine to help me breathe. To be honest, I couldn't decide. So I prayed and cried out, Lord, if you're going to take me, please don't let it come to that. Please take me quickly. More distressing than the physical pain and discomfort one feels due to the illness is the isolation and loneliness one experiences. Remarkably, although I was alone, I never really felt alone. I constantly talked to our Lord, telling Him all my complaints, the discomfort I was feeling, and the fact that I had no one to help me and minister to my needs. I frequently came to Him for guidance in choosing what treatment to take, and sought Him for solace and comfort when my CT scans didn't improve as I wanted them to. Once I even asked the Lord if it is His will to let me see my wife one more time before He took me. On the surface, it did not seem to make sense that I should end up sick when there was such a need for doctors to attend to the patients. But I realized the Lord was teaching me precious lessons about intimacy with Him and the assurance of my eternal destiny. The Lord turned my illness into a blessing. I was the recipient of so much love and concern from my family, both immediate and extended, all my relatives, my patients, my friends, my D12, my D group, and my colleagues who took care of me. Everyone started praying for me. I had never felt so loved in my life. It was truly a humbling experience. I didn't deserve to live. So many of my colleagues didn't make it. But I knew our Lord had a plan and He was in control. As Jeremiah wrote in chapter 29 verses 11 to 12, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's only because of God's grace and mercy that I stand before you now. I was discharged on April 6 after 17 days of confinement and I'm back to serving the Lord in Lung Center, St. Luke's Medical Center Global City, 
and Siemens Hospital by seeing patients. I am Dr. Newell Nakpil. To our God be all the glory, honor, and praise. I praise God for Dr. Nakpil's testimony. You notice, here is a doctor, expert in medicine, yet he was afflicted with COVID-19. And yes, he was concerned about his own future, his family. But what do you notice? In the midst of uncertainties and fear, he began to focus on the Lord again. You see, knowing the Lord is the only antidote that I know that will help us overcome the problem of fear, worry, anxiety. And the truth is, many people are concerned, worried, and fearful. So this message is very important. From fearful to fearless. What is the secret? Well, the secret is Psalm 27, no God and no fear. Notice something. If you know God, no fear. On the contrary, no God, no fear. Versus no God, no fear. We will focus on knowing God. The major outline of Psalm 27 is really the confidence, the fearlessness of David in the midst of danger. The outline can be broken down as follows. A personal encounter with God is the key to knowing God and overcoming fear. Pursue intimacy and pray expectantly. Let's begin with Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Do you notice the psalmist David began by confessing, proclaiming his personal knowledge of who God is. According to the psalmist, the Lord, the personal name of God, Yahweh, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Notice the personal pronoun, my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? We need a real personal relationship with God. The first step in overcoming fear, developing confidence in God, is a personal relationship with God. A personal encounter with God. David said three things about God. My light. Next, my salvation and my security, my refuge. Why is this so important? Let's begin with what he said about the Lord is my life. For David, in Psalm 36, he wrote the following, For with you, with God, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. What does that mean? In the light of God, we see light. You see, the idea is this. There are many things going on in this world. And many times, we do not know the truth. We do not know what is really the right perspective. David is saying, in your light, I see light. Based on God's perspective, I can now begin to understand what's happening. Why is this so crucial? Well, 2 Corinthians tell us. If our gospel is veiled, the word veiled is from that word belo, you know, a covering, you cannot see. It is veiled to those who are perishing. The Bible says if the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is something that people don't understand, what is the reason? This is the reason. 
in whose case the God of this world, the God of this world is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Notice, blinded the minds. There is such a thing as spiritual eyes, not the physical eyes, the spiritual eyes that enable us to see the truth. But the Bible says Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, the perishing. They cannot see. So that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If people don't understand the good news about Jesus, that He's our Savior, He's our Lord, the reason is they are blinded. They cannot see. My advice is be patient when you and I share the good news. Be patient with our loved ones. Because many times what we have is religion. But we don't have a relationship with God. Why? Because they don't see. They are blinded. Many people think the way to heaven is through religion. They don't realize the truth. That's why how do we know the truth? Well, the Bible tells us when a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When we turn to Jesus, our eyes are open. In fact, in John 8, Jesus made an amazing declaration. Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. Notice, I am the light. In the Old Testament, the Lord is my light. Jesus is now saying, I am the light. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. The implication, without Jesus, we are in darkness. We cannot comprehend the truth. But once we follow Jesus, we can see. Let me ask you, what do you base your judgment what do you base your decision-making? Is it human opinion? Is it on the books you have read? Is it on the media? So how do you determine what is right and what is wrong? I've learned that it is God's perspective through Jesus. I can learn to see what is right and what is wrong. Notice David also said the Lord is my salvation. Salvation begins with knowing who God is. In John 17, this is eternal life that they may know, notice, know, relationship, intimacy, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the key to having eternal life is relationship with God through Jesus. And David said, not only that is the Lord my salvation, the Lord is my refuge, my fortress, his security. What does that mean? Well, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give eternal life to them. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Do you notice salvation is in Jesus? I give eternal life. What else? They will never perish. That, my friend, is security. They'll never perish. But on top of that, Jesus gave us an assurance. No one will snatch them out of my hand. It is important to overcome fear. You have to have a relationship with God. You have to know who God is. Our light. You have to know the Lord is our salvation. And you have to know the Lord is our security. Without a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, how do you overcome fear? No wonder. The next verse is very clear. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fall. David was not writing in a vacuum. He was not writing in the palace, in the midst of danger. David is saying, when these people come, how do I deal with them? Though a host 
and come against me, my heart will not fear. Notice host. The word host means army. Lots of people. You have to know that David was a man who understood the meaning of being a fugitive. The government was after him. The army of King Saul was after him to capture him and if possible to kill him. David was always running. So David understood what fear is. David understood what danger is. And I praise God that David was willing to write down his journal, how he dealt with fear. Though a war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Do you notice? How did he overcome fearfulness to fearless? Knowing God, I shall be confident because of a personal relationship with God. Therefore, if you know God, no fear. So how do you know God? Personal relationship. But next, you need to pursue intimacy. It's one thing to know God. But I've discovered something. If you have a personal relationship with God, a personal encounter with God, God begins to give you a hunger. You'll want to pursue Him. Look at what David did. Verse 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek. Notice he began with one thing. That means priority. For David, this is the most important. One thing I have asked. Why did he place there, I've asked? Because David knew that apart from the grace of God, how will we ever know him? So he asked God to help him. This is the real truth. Apart from God, apart from God revealing himself to you and to me, how will we ever be intimate with him? I've always shared this with people. If I want to know President Duterte, if I want to know President Donald Trump, it is almost impossible. I can visit him, but if they will not give me time, if they will not open up, how will, we, how will I know him? The same thing with your boss. If you are an employee, you can work for your boss for many years and still not know him. To be able to know somebody, the person, the higher up, must be willing to take you into his confidence and to reveal himself. It's like marriage. You can be with somebody, but if that person does not open up, you will not know him. I praise God that David understood this principle. And God was more than willing to reveal himself. So David said, one thing I have asked, meaning this is the most important thing. Not many, one thing, one priority. I shall seek. What will he seek? What will he focus on? I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Do you know what this means? In God's presence. David is saying, I want to be in the presence of God. That's the hunger of David, to know the Lord. I don't know what you are pursuing. For many of us, we pursue many things. For some people, it's career. For some people, it's money. For some people, it's a love relationship. For some people, it's position. Whatever it is, can I warn you? These things can be good. Family can be good. Children can be good. Career can be good. Except when they become more important than God, that becomes idolatry. And the moment you put anything ahead of God, my friend, you will never really experience intimacy with God. Because it is called idolatry. And idolatry is doomed for disappointment. Honest truth. Many of us seek happiness. But you cannot find happiness apart from putting God first. You may try. Temporal pleasure. Temporal joy, perhaps. But if you really know who God is, you will begin to understand David's theology. 
I will put God first. You know why? He wanted to worship the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in His temple. Notice, to behold the beauty. Grammatically, that word means to gaze, to focus, to worship. To this day, I'm still learning about the beauty of the Lord. I realize it will take me eternity to learn about God. I can almost predict when we see Jesus someday for eternity, what will we be doing? I tell you what we will be doing. On top of serving God, on top of reigning with Him, on top of worshiping Him, you will be learning and ever learning about the infinite God. You know why? God is infinite. You will never exhaust the knowledge of God in eternity in your lifetime. Why? Because God is infinite. I just think of the beauty of God, His character, His love. Hard to understand. His patience, His grace, His faithfulness. This is amazing. His holiness, His purity. And above all, how do you understand the majesty of God, unchangeability of God, eternity of God, for eternity, His self-existence. Nobody made God. God does not need anyone. And yet, He is self-sustaining. And yet, He loves you and loves me. The beauty of the Lord. Can you comprehend it? And that's why I suggest, begin to learn to worship God. Once you have tasted the goodness of God, you will want to know Him more, seek Him more. And let me explain to you, the myth of no time. When you say you don't have time to pursue God, to worship Him, can I tell you it's a myth? What do I mean? The truth is this. When you say you have no time to spend time worshiping God, studying the Bible, knowing God more, it is not because you don't have time. It's because it is not important enough. So if you don't have time, for your family, the problem is not because you don't have time. It is not priority. If you don't have time to study God's Word, the problem is not because you don't have time. It is not priority. It is not important. In my case, because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus, I have made sure in my life, in my calendar, in my schedule, I prioritize prayer. I prioritize reading the scripture, I prioritize worshiping God. Do you realize last Sunday, I gathered our family together, we were together, worshiping God, listening to His Word. There is something about worship. To me, I find that important. So, I hope you understand, life is about choices. You choose what is important. I cannot choose that for you. David made a choice. One thing I ask, to pursue the Lord. I do not know what are your priorities today, but I pray that you will prioritize the pursuit of knowing God. What is worship? Our proper response to who God is, what He has done for us, and what He continues to do. You see, David understood who God is, what He has done, and what he continues to do. And that's why David's life is a life of worship. Now, it does not mean perfection. But it does mean the following. Your lifelong pursuit is a life of worship. Not only that, you will want to please him. Look at what David talked about who God is and what he has done for him. David said, in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. See, David understood who God is and what God has done, what he continues to do. He will conceal me, meaning he will guard me, he will protect me in the secret place. He will hide me, he will lift me up on a rock. David knew 
that his security, his protection is from the Lord. That's why he worshiped him. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. See, David knew what God is able to do. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. David said, I will offer sacrifices. You see, worship is knowing who God is, what he has done, and what he continues to do. That is intimacy. Intimacy with God will lead to worship. Because knowing him, your response, the response of intimacy is really worship. I will sing I will sing praises. Do you notice the repetition? I will sing. That should have been enough. No, no, no. I will keep singing praises. To whom? To the Lord. A person that has a personal relationship with God and knows God and who is intimate with God will want to worship Him. I like the quotation of A.W. Tozer. I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the Word of God, that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. You know, this statement is very strong. What he's trying to imply is if you find worship boring, if you are not excited about spending time with the Lord every Sunday together in private worship, Perhaps you should examine your own heart, your own life. Do I really know the Lord? Notice I'm not saying, do you know about God? I'm talking about, do you know Him personally? Do you know about Jesus? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Do you know Jesus personally, intimately, as your Savior, as your refuge? What is worship? What is intimacy with God? It is the pleasing of God that is at the heart of worship. A life of worship for David is pleasing God. So, what can we learn about David? How do we overcome fear, fullness to fearless? No God, no fear. How? Well, a personal encounter, a personal relationship with God, pursue intimacy, and lastly, pray expectantly. Why? I've discovered about something about prayer. The more you know God, the more you like to pray. Do you notice when your prayer life is anemic, when your prayer life is not vibrant? Why? Is it because you feel you don't need the Lord? You feel like you can be on your own? That's our nature today. We want independence. For David, because of knowing who God is, he is completely dependent. His life was a life of prayer. Not just prayer, pray expectantly. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Be gracious to me and answer me. Do you know this? Very personal. Lord, I'm crying to you. Be gracious. Answer me. You said, seek my face. My heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Notice how the grammar changes. He's now saying, Lord, you are inviting me. You are able to hear the voice of God. You see, through prayer, through intimacy, it's not just a one-way street of you talking to God. It is listening. David is able to listen to God's invitation. And what is that invitation? It's an invitation to you and to me. Seek my face. God is saying, get to know me. Seek my face. Seek me. And praise God. God gave us an amazing promise. Look at the promise. In James chapter 4, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Grammatically, if you draw near to God, if you make yourself closer to God, the promise is He will draw near to you. There, 
It's such simplicity in our relationship with God. Many times, my wife wants me to be near her. See, many times we walk together and she would like me to walk side by side. But the truth is, if she walks ahead of me, we won't be together. Many times, you and I, we walk ahead of God. We don't draw near to Him. How do you draw near to Him? Very simple. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. It has to do with holiness. God is saying, get rid of sin. Cleanse your hands. Purify your heart. Notice the heart. God is after holiness, purity. The only thing that will prevent us from developing intimacy with God is sin. Now, sin comes in various forms. Many times, it is respectable sin. Pride. Self-righteousness. And God is saying, those will prevent us from having intimacy. Because God is a holy God. And that's why he added the word, don't be double-minded. In other words, you and I must love intimacy with God more than any other sin. And I've discovered this from my own life. If I do something, I know that's against the heart of God, the will of God. Something happens. I feel a distance. I don't know how to explain this. But my conscience bothers me. My spirit bothers me. But when I get rid of that, whatever, that sin or whatever that action I'm doing, I come before God, I honestly admit my mistake, immediately I experience intimacy. So intimacy is something that God invites us. And David was a man of prayer. That's how you become intimate, when you spend time praying. So how often do you pray? Well, I suggest prayer is an attitude of dependence. You can pray in the morning, noon, night, every day, every moment, but it's an attitude. Notice he said, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. You see, prayer is being honest with God. And David is saying, Please, Lord, do not hide your face from me. I am not perfect. Do not turn your servant away in anger. I know I'm a sinner. You have been my help, Lord. You have been faithful to me. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Do you see the dependence of David, the honesty of his prayer? Many times we think if we pursue God and we have a relationship with him, all our problems are resolved. Nothing is farther from the truth. God may allow problems. For what purpose? To draw us even closer to him. My father and my mother have forsaken me but the Lord will take me up. Now, scholars have debated, when did this happen? We don't really know. Because the reality is this, when David was running away from Saul, even the parents became scared. But then eventually, David invited his family members to join him. So we don't exactly know when did this happen, but the point of this statement is simply this human relationships are so fragile you can translate this as even if my father and my mother have forsaken me your best friend may want to help you but because of circumstances beyond their control they seem absent well for david his security is not in human relationships it's in god Notice his prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in the level path because of my foes. What is true prayer? If you know God, you will want to know God's way. He says, Lord, teach me your way, not my way. Many times we want to do things my way. Somebody who has a relationship with God, who knows God, will sooner or later discover that the best thing in life is to do God's will, God's way, not my way. Lead me in a level path because of my foes. What does it mean, lead me? Lord, guide me. I need you. I need your strength. David was always conscious of the reality of danger. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries. False witnesses have risen against me. Such 
as those who breathe out violence. So David knew his danger. And because of that, look at his prayer life. Lord, teach me your way. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Not just knowing God. To know God is to know his ways. What does that mean? The ways of the Lord. Well, let me tell you the warning of God. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way which seems right to a man. In other words, our culture, our media, our friends will tell us this is the right thing to do. What is popular? But you know what is popular may not be God's way. In fact, the Bible warns us, it seems right. It makes sense. But the end is the way of death. The best example I can think of is what, ha is what happened recently to my daughter who is in the States. By the way, I permission to share with you the following story. She was counseling one of her best friends. Because her best friend got involved with another man. And her best friend is supposed to be a Christian. So my daughter asked us for advice. How do I counsel my best friend? And I praise God because my daughter's heart is pure. She wanted to help this girl. Now let me tell you how deceptive Satan is. You see, when my daughter asked her, why are you entertaining this relationship? You are married. You know what she told my daughter? God wants me to be happy. What about my happiness? I'm not happy with my husband. My husband is not the person I want to really be married to. My daughter was surprised. So she asked for Bible verses that talks about the importance of faithfulness. You see, Satan is a liar. His lies are something like this. To be happy, do whatever you feel like doing. Be independent. Freedom will give you happiness. That is the ways of men. Do what you want. Do ever what feels right. But that's not true. Do you realize the ways of the Lord is different? There is no real happiness apart from God. That's the way of the Lord. God made us. He knows what is really best for us. He knows what will really maximize our joy, our happiness. Do you realize it's like oil and water, you cannot mix it. To be happy without God is an impossibility. When I say really happy, I'm not talking about temporal happiness, temporal pleasure. I'm talking about lasting happiness, lasting joy. I'm reminded of a good friend of mine who was my classmate from elementary up to high school. And you know, he chose a path. I really thought he began to follow Jesus. But something happened. He lived a double life. Two families. And when I met him again recently, I look at him. Physically, he has AIDS no longer healthy. His family life is not happy. Why? You need to pray, Lord, teach me your way. What are the ways of the Lord? In the ways of the Lord may be different from the ways of men. But David prayed that prayer. What about you? Do you know the Lord? Are you pursuing intimacy with him? Is this how you pray? Lord, teach me your way so that I will follow your way, not my way. Guide me. How do you know the ways of the Lord? The Bible is very clear. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The objective truth of God's way, God's will, will never contradict God's word. Your word is a lamp. So if you are sincere in wanting to do God's will, to do things God's way, please invest time in studying the Bible. Because 
Bible, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Notice, what is prayer? Prayer is waiting. Prayer is not just talking to God. It's waiting on God. It's listening to God. I would have despaired unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Somebody who knows God will be prayerful and be patient. Waiting. Because prayer is waiting. Many people don't understand. Prayer is not doing nothing. It is waiting expectantly. While waiting on God, you do your part. While waiting on God, you obey Him. While waiting on God, you serve Him. But the whole purpose of waiting on God is because you know who God is. You know He's faithful and you are clinging on to His promises. Amazing truth. I would have despaired. I would have been discouraged. Unless I had believed. Notice a statement of faith. I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do you know that God is good? Do you know that God will promise to give you blessings not after you die? Yes, blessings will be there. But in the meantime, while on earth, God is also very real in your life. For example, the Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see the goodness of God. This is written by David. David knew God is good. How did he know God is good? O oh, taste and see. Personal experience. You ask me, I can honestly say from the bottom of my heart, God is good. I look at what God did with my life with my family, our family business, the ministry, with our children. It's amazing. God is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted? Have you encountered the Lord? Notice how blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. If you put your trust in Him, if you depend upon Him, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord, condition, you seek the Lord, prioritize Him, develop intimacy, shall not be in want of any good thing. Now, what is God's good thing for you may not be exactly what you like, but God promised you it's going to be good. So people ask me, is it possible that what is good for God is something I don't like. Well, I can honestly tell you, there are certain things in my life that has happened which I don't like at that time. But when I look back, I realize it's good. How do I learn humility? How do I learn to trust in the Lord? Isn't it by allowing problems to come into my life? God is so good. He wants what best. What's best for you and for me. So the word to wait on the Lord is a beautiful word. It means to be bound together. It, it comes from this word kava. To be bound. It's like different strings. You bind them together. So to wait on the Lord is to bound yourself. It's like strings. You say, Lord, I need you. You cling on to the Lord. And you allow God to cling on to you. So that's intimacy. That is oneness. That's the meaning of wait for the Lord. Notice, wait for the Lord. Meaning, wait for Him to act. Be strong. While waiting, be strong. While waiting, let your heart take courage. That's the meaning of praying expectantly. So, how do you wait? Let me give you an example. This just happened recently. For you to appreciate the story, my wife and I have a good friend who lives in a foreign country. And we Zoom together and uh, we try to mentor this couple. Well, this is the story of the example of waiting for the Lord. You see, this person 
this particular couple, the wife and the husband is very close to us. But the wife discovered that the husband was being unfaithful. Almost 20 years. You can imagine the pain. And when she discovered this years ago, the man promised he will change. But the truth is this. He did not really change. Can you imagine the pain? So this lady, who is very close to the family, asked us for advice. What do I do? Would you believe it? Church members, her friend, told her, divorce your husband. Because if you don't divorce him, you are condoning his sin. Now, I was shocked when I heard that advice. So she came to us. What should I do? We laid out for her the heart of God. I said, if you want to use adultery as a reason to separate from your husband, of course you may. But that is not the heart and spirit of God. God wants you to forgive. God wants you to save your marriage. But you cannot do this on your own. You need to trust God. So by waiting for God to do something, what did this girl do? Well, she kept on having her small group, kept on teaching the Bible, keep on being nice to her husband. You know what's amazing? Her husband spoke to us. I do not know why my wife is so nice. She is really nice to me. A few years ago, the husband told the wife, I think I'm born again, finally. Now, the guy has been going to church for 20 years. But when they finally tune in, I'm not saying because of CCF, but because of the grace of God, they began to follow our Sunday services. The husband said, I discover I am a counterfeit Christian. You know what she said? Well, you know what he said? I'm the best counterfeit Christian. And the Lord convicted me. And you know, for a couple of years, he stopped that relationship. Probably three years ago. Last week, this girl called him up. And he was surprised. He blocked the number. And the girl found a way to contact him through Facebook. But what's so amazing is my, this man told his wife, told my friend, you answer the phone. You talk to this girl. You know why to me that's so touching? It is very touching because only God can change somebody to resist temptation and to be able to be honest with his wife and told his wife to deal with that girl. And my friend, many times you will never know what God can do if you don't learn to wait. I realize when you learn to wait on the Lord, I do not know how long, but in God's time, you will discover, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For David, he believed that God's goodness he will see. But he does not know when. But he knows his prayer in my lifetime. Well, for this family, I praise God. The family is intact. The marriage is intact. The husband is loving the Lord, serving the Lord. But just imagine, just imagine, if this girl divorced her husband, what would have happened? She will never know what God can do. What happened to her children? You know, friends, the consequences of not waiting on the Lord is so serious that many people don't realize God's goodness is there for us, but you will never know what you will miss if you become so impatient. The truth is this. We face 
dangers. We face many fear, family, finance, relationships. How do you deal with this? Let's learn from David. Know him. The only antidote of overcoming fear is intimacy with God. If you know God, you will learn to pursue him. You will learn to pray more. And you will learn to wait. If this message has somehow touched your heart and you say, Peter, I want to have that kind of experience like David. Remember, David was in trouble, but he experienced the goodness of God. Well, I pray that you ask Jesus to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior. To learn to wait upon Him is to trust Him. You cannot trust Him if you don't know Him. And you will not know Him if you don't surrender your life to Jesus. You have to admit you need Him. Admit your sinfulness. Then turn to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I admit that I need you. I want to know your ways. I want to experience your goodness. But Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Today, I invite you, Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to know you. I surrender my life to you. Change my heart. By faith, I will accept your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. I now surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I 
Thank you for joining us today. Briefly, just to help us all process the things we have seen and heard this morning, we have some discussion questions for you on the screen later. Watch out for it. Use these questions when you gather with your friends or family, or use it in your own personal quiet time with God. By the way, there is something new. Starting this week, we are posting video reflections on the message today. They are from people who would Share their thoughts and insights on some of the points you've heard in the message. Look for it in our YouTube or Facebook channel. Secondly, if you want to worship God in giving, we have some information below that can provide you the opportunity to give securely and worship God through your giving. Also, our Children's Church online happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We invite your kids to have a half-hour worship time with us. Just text us if you are interested on the number listed below. Lastly, if you had made the choice to follow Christ, then we want to encourage you to tell us your story through the links below. We can answer any questions you may have and help you to live your new life in faith. Again, thank you. And on behalf of Christ Commission Fellowship San Francisco, this is Patrick Concepcion saying, Be not afraid and fight the good fight of faith. Have a blessed day.